I am. You don't need to, you can, just, you can, he can hear you over that mic. Oh, I, um, we can hear you. I see we can hear you um, on the phone and you hear me through, through the mic, right? I don't think that will work on my board. Honestly, it's going to have to speak louder, speak louder into that on his board board.
Previously served, previously served for three years for the National Advisory Board for the Agency of Health Care Research and Development. And also served and also as a member of the Medicaid Commission working on race and rehabilitation. Race and rehabilitation. And 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 including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the U.S. Times, and has appeared on ABC's 2020 on hundreds of radio and radio television programs. She's a co author of Why Obamacare. Rome for America, and she speaks extensively in the U.S. and abroad. So we're thrilled to have her with us tonight. She's going to give us a, the latest update on where we stand in the health care debate, uh, and she's been very much involved in it. So she's probably one of the best people in the country to give us that update. Grace Marie. Hello. Thank you so much for having me with you tonight. Hello, Empower You. Thank you all very much for your patience with the technology. And thank you, Dan and Jay, and all the team for, for organizing this session today. The timing really couldn't be better, although I think all of us thought we were going to be in a very different pos position on Tuesday after um, the House was to consider the repeal and replace legislation. But here we are, and we'll be talking about uh, what we expect next, why the challenges are continue to be just as real as they were before last Friday, and what the path forward may be. And I thought let's just start with a little bit of background and talk about the political landscape and why this issue of repealing and replacing Obamacare continues to be so important. If you look at the numbers, when the um, the 2008 elections, when the Democrats took control not only the White House, but both the House and the Senate. The Democrats had 60 votes in the Senate, which was a crucial magic number, and they had uh, 257 votes in the House of Representatives. Big margins with actually a lot more flexibility than we have now. They also controlled um, 17 states where they had the governorship and both houses under Democratic control, uh, and only 10 were Republican. But look what's happened in, by 2016. Because largely of the American people's opposition to Obamacare, a consistent issue throughout the last four elections, we've seen now Republicans controlling 52 seats in the Senate, not the magic 60, but certainly a majority, so that they are therefore able to control the committees. And Republicans have 241 votes in the House of, of Representatives. But importantly, they now control 25 state legislatures, as well as the governorship. So there is a, really a major Republican sweep. That is why I think all of us felt so devastated on Friday when the House failed in its effort to bring repeal and replace legislation to the floor. It's not over yet, folks, but it's going to be a heavier slog, mostly because this law is no more popular than the day it was passed. It's no more, in fact, if anything, it's much less popular. It's, it's it not only this, this map now, looks like sort of the simple version of Obamacare because it's gotten so infinitely more complex than anyone really could have imagined, starting with 2,700 pages of legislation. Now, 440,000 40, pages of regulation at least have been spawned by this legislation. And look at some of the results of what we've seen. So when you look at the numbers of how how, what's the impact of this bill? Remember the President, President Obama had said, we're finally going to get to universal coverage. Everybody's going to have health insurance. Well, what happened is that we had, we have 6.7 million more people with individual coverage. 
but we've lost almost 9 million people with group coverage and the self-insured market has gone up a little bit, 5 million. But there's still a net loss in group coverage and only about less than fewer than 3 million people additionally have been added to the private health insurance roles in despite the fact that so much has happened throughout the health sector because of this law. Three million more people have health insurance and certainly 30 million are not even expected to get it under this law. The great majority of coverage has been through Medicaid. Let's look at some of those slides. Medicaid and the state children's health insurance program have been responsible for almost 85% of the coverage expansion, only 16% through the exchanges. So the Medicaid expansion has been responsible for the great majority of the coverage expansion under Obamacare. And that's true not only in the states that decided to expand Medicaid to childless, able-bodied adults, but also in those states where there was what they call a woodwork effect many people signing up for Medicaid who otherwise had not because they didn't want to be subject to the individual mandate. So let's talk about that individual mandate and what some of the effect of that has been. So about 23, 24 million people were subject to the penalty for, for the individual mandate. They did not buy coverage even though they were required to do so under the Affordable Care Act. About 6.5 million actually paid the penalty. Almost 13 million got a hardship exemption, and about 4.3 million didn't even didn't do anything. They didn't get a hard, they didn't pay the penalty and they didn't get a hardship exemption. So the net increase again in private coverage is 2.3 million people according to this, um, this, this analysis out of the 40, 50 million people that were supposed to have been covered under this law, clearly, clearly this law has been a failure. So let's look a little bit at the kind of step, taking a step back to the congressional process for repealing, replacing Obamacare. There was a lot of the process that was required really required, what had a great deal to do with actually the content of the legislation. So last year's partial repeal bill, and I say partial because in order to be able to get a bill to Senate and through the Senate in a filibuster proof way, which means that you can pass it with a simple majority, not the 60 votes that uh, would be required to make sure you, it can't be filibustered by the other party, they weren't able to address all of it. But what it did was immediately repeal all the taxes in Obamacare, the individual mandate, the employer mandate, and as that said, all the taxes on medical devices, health insurance, prescription drugs, all of the taxes that have not only hurt American families, but also driven up the cost of health insurance premiums. The, um, the law, the, the bill that was passed last year, sent to President Obama's desk, also would have repealed, after a two-year delay, all of the coverage provisions in Obamacare, creating a sort of a bridge to new coverage, to creating a bridge so that the people currently on Obamacare wouldn't lose their coverage immediately. There was, I think importantly, it's important to note, didn't actually get rid of the Medicaid expansion. It just reduced the payment from the federal government back to the normal federal match rate for Medicaid payments in that state. So I think some of those things are important to recognize. What did the bill do that was passed by the Congress, passed by the Senate, and went to President Obama's desk last January that was vetoed? This is really a pretty good synopsis of it. It was a much simpler bill. So. What do we know now? Obamacare is collapsing. I think it's really important for people to understand that this law cannot be sustained, cannot succeed on its own. It's, it's really a train wreck, but here we have a, a plane wreck. 
And here, of course, the pilot is a donkey, a Democrat. And looking back at the Republican passengers saying, what did you do to make this plane crash? Well, really is structural to the law itself. So what did the 2017 replace legislation do that Congress was considering up until last Friday? Until last Friday, I thought the Dredge Report headline on Friday afternoon was particularly appropriate, showing the Hindenburg blowing up and a President, former President Obama with thumbs up saying, Obamacare stays. So it was a catastrophe. And members went home really in shock over what they had done. Oh my goodness, you know, you, you really were right that this was our chance to repeal Obamacare. So um, a little bit too far ahead there, let's go back. So what was in the, the replace bill? The bill that was before the House that was not voted on last Friday would also have repealed all of Obamacare's taxes, about 20 taxes, but one of them, the Cadillac tax, would have been delayed until eventually 2025, 2026, second version. But all the rest of them would have been completely repealed. That is a huge, huge tax cut for the American, American economy a $1 trillion tax cut. It would also have zeroed out all the tax penalties for the individual and employer mandate. What that means is that, that it, you would not have been subject to the individual mandate and the employer mandate because there would have been no penalties. Basically, they can't, through the rules, have gotten rid of the penalty itself, the mandates themselves, but they could have zeroed out the penalty so no one would order, would have paid it. So therefore, it's sort of default, um, letting people escape from, those, from the mandate. It would have also protected people currently on coverage, that it, it would have preserved the Medicaid expansion for a time, much the way the earlier repeal bill would have, talking to the governors about this. Also, it would have included a new kind of subsidy for people to purchase health insurance going forward. It would also have targeted some of Obamacare's cost inflating regulations, such as the age bans telling young people that they have to pay so much more for their coverage than, than their parents and, and even grandparents do, that they instead of having a five to one age ban, a three to one age ban, Older people would only pay three times more than younger people. The law would have given them the states an option of moving that up to five to one. That would have made premiums much more affordable for young people. It would have drawn them very likely into the pools. So the pools would not have the decline they do now with so many older, sicker people that it's just really driving premiums through the roof. It also would have allowed the new tax credits to be used for off-exchange plans. Remember that under Obamacare, you can only use your tax credit in either a state or the healthcare.gov federal exchange. And so those, those tax credits were only useful if you were purchasing coverage in the exchange. Here they say you're going to have a lot more options than just exchange coverage. So also what it had done, I think importantly, it contained a major health expansion of health savings accounts, and there would have been much less federal regulation and turning a lot more over to the states, the authority to help regulate and oversee their health insurance markets. It would have also provided some funds to the states to stabilize their risk pools, uh, be able to create high risk pools for people who really are just too expensive to insure. It would have provided a lot more flexibility to the states in benefit to start design. Instead of Washington's Obamacare cookie cutter health plans, it would have given the states the opportunity to approve plans that people may actually want to buy instead of being forced to buy policies that contain so many mandates that they don't want or need and frankly can't afford they would have been able to buy policies that would have been more, fle more flexible 
and much more likely suited to their needs. There would have been age adjusted tax credits. And we'll talk about that a little bit more because this was a different way of subsidizing health insurance. Older people need more health services than younger people. So the tax credits would have basically been based upon your age. If you were up to age 30, you would have gotten a tax credit of about $2,000 a year. If you're over 50, you would have gotten a tax credit of over of, of about $3,500 over $64,000. And that's for everybody in the family. So a family could have gotten tax credit. Refundable tax credits means that even if you didn't owe that much in taxes, <laughs> pardon me, you'd be able to, to still get the credit, that that would have been a different way of subsidizing health insurance. So the IRS didn't have to be so much involved. But there was a lot of pushback, as you saw, from the AARP and others who said that just wasn't going to be enough for older Americans, not quite ready for Medicare, but needing more help with their health insurance. So they put some extra money in the bill for the states to be able to supplement that and also to put a cap so that Bill Gates, for example, couldn't get a tax credit. You know, had to be under a certain income level for you to actually be eligible for it. There was, a, again, and that was controversial. Another controversial part of it was something called the continuous coverage protection. One of the reasons that Obamacare failed is because of, as we know, guaranteed issue. No matter when you sign up for health insurance, an insurance company has to, has to sell you the policy and they can't charge you any more than they would have if you had been paying premiums all along. So what we have seen is a lot of gaming the system. People jumping into health insurance when they have some major medical need, getting the coverage, getting the care, often tens of thousands of dollars or more, and then dropping their policy after they're finished with their treatment. And if they then say, well, next year I need more care, and then I'll go back in, there's no penalty. So what does that mean? That means that the pools really wasn't health insurance anymore, and the pools were full only of the sicker people needing this expensive care. So what this law, would, what the, health, the American Health Care Act would have done is basically say, we need you to have continuous coverage. You don't have, we're not going to make you buy health insurance, but if you don't buy health insurance during open enrollment periods, then you're going to have to pay 30% more on your premiums when you buy that policy for one year. So that was controversial, but something that, that you need because people have now figured out how to gain the health insurance markets, and they're just not going to work if you, if you let people only come in when they're sick. I think probably the most important, from my perspective, provision of the American Health Care Act was the Medicare modernization. Medicare, Medicaid is a, did I say Medicare? I mean Medicaid. Medicaid is a terrible program. It's a ghetto of a health insurance plan. So many people, now almost 70 million people are on, on Medicaid throughout the 50 states and territories. And many of them cannot find a doctor to see them, which is why they go to expensive hospital emergency rooms to get care. If they wait long enough, eventually they will be seen. But it's also extremely difficult for them to find a specialist and even more difficult to have continuity of care. It's, a, it's an awful program that needs to be reformed. Every time a governor wants to make a smallest change to it, he has to go hat in hand, mother may I, to Washington. And this would have basically said, we're, we're, we believe that these 33 Republican governors and, and the Democratic governors as well can do a better job of managing this program than Washington can, clearly not working. So it would have given states the option of either getting a block grant or a per capita allocation, not just everybody getting the same amount, but both people who have greater needs, multiple disabilities. There would have been a larger federal payment for them. Moms and babies, not terribly expensive to cover, would have gotten a smaller payment. But that would have been an option for the governors. So there were a lot of good provisions in this bill, but there were also a lot of things that, that were sort of outside of the health sector that also made this a very attractive piece of legislation. 
we would have cut federal spending by $1.2 trillion over 10 years. It would have been a tax cut of almost $900 billion. And it would have reduced the federal budget by $337 billion over 10 years. Now, those numbers were changed a little bit when there were some amendments to the bill, but that was the, that was the first score from the CBO. But the CBO also said it was going to leave 24 million people uninsured in 10 years. But what that means is that let's sort of look at the next said actually by 20, in 2017, as soon as the bill was passed and signed into law, that we'd suddenly have 4 million fewer people with health insurance, that 2 million Medicaid beneficiaries, for whom basically Medicaid is free, would just drop coverage because there's not a mandate that they have health insurance. A million people would drop coverage in the exchanges, and another million, they say, would drop out of their job-based coverage. By 2018, 14 million people would decide they just don't want health insurance. So the CBO is basically saying the only thing keeping the coverage numbers up was the individual mandate, because that would have been repealed and zeroed out in the American Health Care Act. People would just drop coverage like flies. We don't believe that's the case. We believe with new subsidies and with many more options for people to get the kind of coverage that would suit them, that they would not have lost coverage. The CBO never said people were going to lose coverage because the subsidies weren't generous enough in the Affordable Care Act, in the American Health Care Act. They were saying they dropped coverage simply because they were no longer required by the federal government to purchase it. We do not agree with that assumption, but that is where all those headlines came from. So what about this, this 2017 effort? Why did this go wrong? The Republicans were trying to repeal as many of the, of the Obamacare provisions as they could through the budget reconciliation process. If they went through regular order, that would mean that it would only take eight Democrats to stop this bill voting that all the Democrats basically could stop it because you would not have the 60 votes you'd need to break a filibuster. But bills that are considered under this process have to meet very strict tests. They have to make, we have to make sure that everything that applies in this bill either directly impacts federal spending or federal taxes. So that's sort of the budget reconciliation process. So that's one of the reasons that the regulations were really not addressable through this process that they were using to make sure it wouldn't be filibustered. The House was very careful in trying to send a bill to the Senate that wouldn't imme immediately be rejected as not meeting this reconciliation test which is why they were reluctant to put all of the mandate requirements, the, the regulate, regulatory requirements in this and try to repeal them because it, the whole thing could have been thrown out and the whole process would have been lost. I'm sure we're gonna talk about this too in our questions and look forward to them. So what's next? So Speaker Ryan has actually called a meeting on Thursday morning and I've been invited to attend to talk about Plan B. When we were talking with them most of this year and saying, what happens if this doesn't work? They said, we don't have a plan B. Well, guess what? Now they need a plan B. And I, I actually learned today at another meeting on Capitol Hill that the members all came together. All the Republican caucus had a big meeting this morning. They're all back in town. And they actually threw the staff out and said, we want to meet sort of a family meeting. And they came out of it, I think, really chastened of thinking, we cannot go back to the voters and say we failed in repealing and replacing Obamacare. They can't even, the, even the repeal vote from last year, and I'm sure you're going to ask me about this, even the repeal vote, vote from last year contained some replace provisions. But we also moved it further in doing what I think is some of the most important entitlement reform in a generation through the Medicaid reform, as well as creating a bridge and a platform for people who are shut out of the employer market, 
for people who don't qualify for public programs to, be, to get some help in purchasing their health insurance. So what's Speaker Ryan going to do? They're meeting. They're saying they're going to go back at this. We will see. Whatever happens, I believe that the states are going to have a really crucial role going forward. They are looking for opportunities. Dr. Price at HHS is anxious to approve, approve waivers that the states will, are expected to request and how they can have more flexibility with their Medicaid programs. They're encouraging states to use a, a provision called the state innovation waivers to be able to basically throw out a lot of the Obamacare rules and say, this is the way we want to do this in Kansas or Kentucky or Texas, and we don't want to have to be under this Obamacare cloud. And because Dr. Tom Price, a good friend of the Galen Institute, a good friend of the conservative movement, is now in charge of writing those regulations and approving, and his, his staff is in charge of approving those waivers, there will be a lot more flexibility than we ever saw under the Obama administration. But there's also an immediate risk to this law collapsing, this bill effort collapsing the way it did last Friday. A number of states are saying, well, you know, we got left out of this Medicaid expansion and we're worried that we might be penalized for having rejected it all along. So some states, including Kansas, this is a picture of their capital in Kansas, are thinking about expanding Medicaid. So because of the collapse of the effort last Friday, you may see several more states join that expansion population that were waiting and holding off because they know it's not right for their state, it's too expensive, people deserve the dignity of private health insurance not being put on Medicaid, but it's a, it's a very real risk that, that states are going to look at the opportunity to expand Medicaid when they otherwise would not have if this bill were moving forward. So let's just talk a little bit more about some of the other things that are, that are going forward, and then I look forward to your questions. Republicans started out this year saying they have a three-pronged plan, regulatory action. The first day that President Trump was in the Oval Office, he signed a waiver giving HHS broad authority to, to look at all of the provisions in the Affordable Care Act that were in impeding the economy, that were making health insurance more expensive, that were causing businesses to struggle, that were causing businesses to not hire new employees, and to also try to stabilize the health insurance market. So the, uh, HHS has issued a rule, it's likely to be final within the next couple of weeks to help give some stability to those health insurance markets that otherwise likely are many, many places in the country may find that they have no health insurer in their state offering coverage to uh, the people who are eligible for tax credits, but they can't find a plan to buy. There are also, I believe that they're going to try to revive this repeal and replace effort. It's going to be more complicated. It's going to be harder. They're going to have to bring new ideas to the table. That's what we'll be talking with Speaker Ryan about on Thursday morning. And then other regular bills to regular order where they believe they might actually be able to get Democrats to support so they don't need to use this convoluted and difficult and narrow reconciliation path. For example, the, um, the House passed last, last week with, with big bipartisan majorities a bill to eliminate antitrust protections for insurers, another that would have allowed cross-state purchasing of health insurance. Those are things that have bipartisan support. Get them over to the Senate, see if the Senator, um, Senator McConnell can get them through the Senate and then to the President's desk. So they have a long list of individual bills that they think they might be able to pass separately. So that's really the strategy. Regulatory, repeal and replace. They, we cannot build a new healthcare system on the wreckage of Obamacare. We have to have a fresh start cannot build this on this crumbling foundation, but we can begin to give states more power and to do targeted reform bills that really will, I think, give, um, give our health sector a chance to begin to recover. So White House executive actions, 
So this is President Trump's executive order. And it's just to really show, you know, he says he wants the HHS to exercise all authority and discretion available to waive, defer, grant exemptions, delay implementation of any provision or requirement in the Affordable Care Act of Obamacare that would impose a fiscal burden on any state, a cost fee, tax penalty, a regulatory burden on individuals, families, healthcare providers, and et cetera. And they are looking, there are 5,000 different regulations or guidelines that already have been implemented just under Obamacare. So Secretary Price is having his staff look at all of those, and he's actually saying, I need help in prioritizing. Which ones of these are the most damaging? Are, are really harming most your ability to purchase a policy, companies' ability to sell them, states' ability to, to be able to provide coverage options for their employees, and targeting those, those regulations, either, either repealing them, well, process to do that through the Congressional Review Act, but they can do it, or um, basically providing additional guidance and, and other ways that people can begin to work around those regulations that have been so suffocating to the innovation in our health sector that we so need. The sector, I actually did a, a Google did a, did a search of how many times in the Affordable Care Act did it say the secretary shall or the secretary may. More than 1,400 times the legislation gives the Secretary of Health and Human Services authority to change, to basically interpret what the law means. Secretary Price means to use that as, as, as uh, literally, if you'll excuse the term, as he can. And the Obama administration certainly made very liberal use of this, but not in the right way, basically rewriting the law. The Galen Institute actually did a, um, has been chronicling all the changes to Obamacare. And we identified 43 provisions that the Obama administration either waived, delayed, or ignored in the law itself. There were a number of places where the Obama administration didn't just go make Rule, new rules according to the 1,400 places that the secretary had authority, but really stretched beyond that to really rewrite the law. That has to be undone. And then I think they will um, very likely try to be as aggressive in trying to dismantle this law as the Obama administration was in trying to make it work. So um, I look forward to your questions. I know that we have uh, those of you who are joining us online, you can send us questions uh, on the chat line. I look forward to uh, hearing from those of you actually in the hall today. And please contact me. All my contact information is right here. I, I invite you to join us also not only at Galen.org, but ObamacareWatch.org. That's a dedicated website that we update many times a day with the latest news and commentary about um, what's happening on this very lively front to repeal and replace Obamacare. If we would have done this, this session a couple of days ago, I would have been very despondent. After today's meetings on Capitol Hill, I'm encouraged that they're going to get back to work and get this done. So, so Jay, Dan, um, can we begin to uh, get some questions from the audience? Let's take some questions. Can you hear us, Grace Marie? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Yes. A round of applause. Thank her for joining us tonight. Um, Thank you. So, you know, we practice this technology. It sounded great. We're going to take a questions. Who's got the first question that they would like to ask? Jay, I can hear you, but I can't hear the audience questions. You have to repeat them for me.
Did you hear that? No, I, I didn't hear the question. Can you repeat it for me? Sure. Our uh, Georgia wants to know, generally, other than insurance, how can the cost of health care itself be reduced? Oh, that's such a good question. You know, cost of health insurance is absolutely the, the, the most important question in all of this health reform debate. That is the thing that has made people so upset. I mean, how many of us know people who had their deductibles double and triple and even quadruple, while their premiums also have gone up? We've got to get control of the costs. It is not going to happen when Washington is in charge. If we move power and control back to the states to give them the opportunity to really have real competition. There's no competition in the Obamacare exchanges. They're all offering the same cookie cutter plan with the same infinitely long list of benefits, which is basically saying you have to buy a Ferrari, you're not going to be able to buy a car. That's not the way the American people want. They want to, young people want, want baby catastrophic coverage. They don't need coverage for a lot of small ailments, but they do need coverage for if something major happens, if Lord forbid they get hit by a bus, they need to have health insurance that's real insurance. A family may want a health maintenance organization. They may like having one place they can go, take the family, and they're not so concerned about seeing the same doctor every time. Other people have different different meds. I have had so many people come to me saying they have really good ideas how to make health insurance more affordable to people. And one of the things that, that Congress is already working on is allowing people to purchase health insurance across state lines, allowing small businesses to pool together so that they're not individually rated. But the most important thing is giving states much more power and authority to approve a wider range of plans, get insurers back in the market so they're competing, and offering policies that people want to buy. One of the reasons health insurance is so expensive is because so many people are keeping their policies when, they're, when, when they have expensive health needs and more and more people that are healthy that we need to have in those pools are opting out. We saw, we saw the chart of a number of people who are just maybe basically walking away from the individual mandate. Getting people back into health insurance and making it affordable, making it attractive is going to be a hugely important part of this, of, of this debate. And also, in this meeting this afternoon on Capitol Hill, we were talking about ways that the states could have more leeway and flexibility in, um, in being able to waive some of these other mandates themselves. I see in the chat room, somebody asked me to explain the three to one, five to one, and that's relevant to this question as well. Basically now, Obamacare says that there can be no more than a three times difference of somebody 60 years old purchasing health insurance versus somebody 27. The 27 year old is going to pay more for that policy because they are subsidizing the 62 year old. And that then they can't, so young people are paying sometimes 75% more for their policies. What are they doing? They're not buying them. So the, the, the American Health Care Act, the House bill, would have changed that to a five to one ratio. The young people, the older people could be charged no more than five times what a younger person is charged for a policy. So you know, this is complicated insurance terminology, but it basically says that young people won't have to pay so much and hopefully they'll come back into the pools, buy those catastrophic policies, and put, put less upward pressure on premiums because of the flexibility with the so-called age band rating. Grace Marie, thank you. Where do you stand on the question from Where do you stand on the Do you agree? So I actually see this also on, on the on the chat room. Where do I stand on the Freedom Caucus position? Freedom Caucus was, you know, had a number of different positions, and they met. Their President Trump met with 125 members, either over the telephone or mostly one on one. He met with the Freedom Caucus for an hour and a half the day before the vote, trying to talk with them and. 
The, the bill was amended a couple of times to meet, uh, meet some of their, their demands, but, but when they, they got to a point of trying to address issues that the Freedom Caucus was demanding, there were about 30 or so members, that they were losing more votes from others than they were gaining from the Freedom Caucus members. So it really became a losing game where they were, they were every time they made a change, they started to lose support someplace else, which is one of the reasons they pulled it because one of the things in the art of the deal, I've read it, but I've read synopses, that, that President Trump, when he wrote this book 30 years ago, said sometimes you have to walk away from a deal and come back to it because you can see that it's really deteriorating. I think that's what he saw here, that the bill was getting worse. Well, actually, toward the end, they lost one of the most important Tax, tax cuts, the, the tax cuts that would have actually made tax reform a lot easier. So when that happens, you have to say, wait a minute, maybe we need to go back to the drawing board and rethink this. I think one of the things I'm going to tell Speaker Ryan on Thursday is that I think they need to rethink the structure of these subsidies. One of the questions here is, why do older people need subsidies because they're on Medicare? Well, Medicare doesn't start until you're 65. And many people, early retirees, free retirees, need help with health insurance premiums up to age 65. They may be out of the workforce, but not yet eligible for Medicare. So those are the people that, that, that we need to be able to help. But the previous tax credits that they were offering really weren't enough to help them because their premiums would be more expensive, right? Under the age rating rules we discussed earlier. So if you were to say, we're going to give money to the states, we're going to give the states the money, it doesn't have to go through the IRS, they can subsidize health insurance for their citizens. They know how many people are on Obamacare now, they've been enrolled, they know how much they're getting in subsidies. It would also give, us, give the states an incentive to approve more options for more affordable plans bring more competition in so that subsidy money would go further. We're going to talk with him about doing those subsidies in a different way so that they would give the states more authority, integrate it with Medicaid funding so that you don't have this cliff when you make too much money, you suddenly fall off of Medicaid and maybe into an exchange. Allow this to be more seamless, allow employers to contribute so that you can have kind of a basket of funds, including contributions from individuals. They need to see that this policy costs real money, somebody's paying for it, and that they value that health insurance. One of the, one of the really good models for this is the Healthy Indiana program that I've studied a lot, started by former Governor Mitch Daniels and uh, Governor Mike, when he was Governor Mike Pence, really took it to another level as hard as it was under the Obama administration, but it basically gives an HSA-like product to people under 200% of poverty. Those are people who are currently eligible for the Medicaid, uh, for, the, for the exchange subsidies, but, but it, they had to contribute into their health savings account in order to be able to qualify for the insurance coverage. And of course, the lower their income, the less they contributed to their account. But everybody had to contribute something. So they saw it as real money. And frankly, they were a lot less likely then to go to the hospital emergency room to get care when they could call a nurse hotline or maybe go to a minute clinic and find out if they could get care much more inexpensively. So there are so many ideas out there like that. If we would return it to the states, one of the big lessons of Obamacare is that the federal government just has no business trying to run one sixth of our economy from Washington. It just doesn't work. Here we have another qu question, Grace. Yes. Hello, my name is Jim. Hi, Jim. Everything. Oh, Jim, I can't hear you. I keep hearing that everything is about getting the government the doctor's office. Yes. Fully agree. One more people at the doctor's and the hospital's office. It's a legal profession. Too many doctors and hospitals have to prescribe 
umpteen procedures to make sure you've got what they already know you've got to cover their buns. We have to get the legal profession out of the doctor. Do you think? That's so, so true. And medical malpractice reform is absolutely. Remember, we were talking about that third bucket of legislative legislative actions. That was, I believe, teed up to have been considered on the House floor this week. It was pulled when they decided, no, we need to go back to the drawing board on, on Obamacare. But that's one of those measures that they believe that they would be able to get bipartisan support for. I frankly think that states may once again be better at doing medical malpractice reform. Some states like Texas and believe it or not, California actually have presented some pretty good models that have lowered medical malpractice costs for doctors, which of course means that their prices don't have to be so high. And have also attracted more doctors to the state because they see it's a much less volatile, litigious environment in the states because they have done medical malpractice reform. So I absolutely agree with you. Congress agrees with you. And this is very high on their agenda. Thank you for that question. Who else has one? Who has a question? Here. Nancy. I'm Nancy, and I have a question regarding the expansion of Since the expansion, have you seen services that were traditionally under Medicaid for elderly and disabled long term services and support? That's my biggest concern is that I'm, I'm expanding Medicaid, especially to able bodied adults that maybe for a short period of time. But there's not an end to it at this point. And my concern is for those are most vulnerable that we're already caring for under the Medicaid program. I'm concerned. Um, Nancy, I, I just couldn't time. agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. I think that that one of the things, there are many things that distress me about um, the passage of Obamacare. But one of them was that they so dramatically expanded this program designed for the most vulnerable people in our society to able-bodied adults. And even one of the architects of Obamacare said that as many as 40% of the people in this expansion population were already eligible for other coverage. They just, you know, their employers were offering it, they had, they had options elsewhere, and they weren't taking it up because Medicaid is basically free. So that's, they, they, they opted out of private coverage and went into, the, went into Medicaid competing with people for doctors who really don't have anywhere else to go. And I think it's just unconscionable. There was a, a the former medical director at Johns Hopkins University Hospital in Baltimore near, near here, pleaded with Congress to please don't expand Medicaid. He said, we can't take care of the patients that we have now on the program. How on earth are we gonna take care of millions more people when we don't have any any new capacity. So I, I could not agree with you more. St this is something that states are going to have to figure out. They, and, and even worse, Obamacare paid the states by basically saying, we're going to give you the full 100% of the cost of these new able-bodied, mostly single adults. We're going to pay 100% of their cost if you go out and enroll them. And so, of course, they did, so they could get their, ins uh, their, uns their insured numbers up. At the same time, they have people on waiting lists who have multiple disabilities who couldn't get on Medicaid. I talked with a state senator in New Hampshire recently. He said, this is so distressing to me, but the federal government is paying us to enroll these able-bodied adults while we neglect the people for whom this program was designed. Governors are, are distressed about this. States are distressed about it. We've got to change it. One of the things that Congress would do with the Medicaid reform is say, we're not gonna pay you more 
for adding able-bodied adults. And by the way, we may decide we're going to have to change the whole funding structure for Medicaid to make sure that you have the resources to take care of the people who most need Medicaid, who have nowhere else to go in a civilized society who will get care, but not putting people on this program that that have other options. So thank you for that question. You're so right. I, I do get a little bit of interference with the background noise and the microphone. So when you talk, if you could put it close to your uh, close to your mouth so I can hear it, I'd really appreciate it. Grace Marie, we, we have a online question. Many are saying Trump supports single payer. Do you believe this is true? Well, he said that. You know, he said, I, I believe in government run health care. He's since backed off of that. And I, I think that he, you know, I don't know what audience he was talking to when he said that. President Obama said it. I think that it's the real risk in America for people who don't understand health care. They think, of course, it's government's role to take care of people. Well, we have EMTALA. That's the law that was passed in the 1980s that says if you show up at a hospital emergency room needing care, that hospital has to treat you, even if you can't pay for it. And federal funds flow to, the, to those hospitals to, co to pay for what they call disproportionate share um, uncompensated care. But that's, that's not a real solution. We want people to have health insurance. But a single-payer government-run system, I mean, we're, we're basically rejecting Obamacare, right? And that was as close as they could get to a government-run health care system. And it, just, it, just, it hasn't worked for America. People want the dignity of private health insurance. They want choice. They want competition. We have some models that work for that in both the private sector and the public sector. I talked about the Healthy Indiana program, the Medicare Part D prescription drug benefit. I know a lot of people were upset that new federal money was spent on that program. But when you look at the structure of it, Private plans compete for seniors' business. Seniors have a lot of choices, including finding those plans that provide the exact drugs they need. They, have, they can change during the year. They can change uh, during open enrollment period. And costs have come in at half of what the Congressional Budget Office estimated they would be by now. So we can run a public program if it involves government, short government, getting government out and setting some of the ground rules, but consumer choice and competition. That's what we need, whether it's public programs or private programs. Question right here. Um, many of the funds for Obamacare was removed from, uh, from Medicare to support Obama. Those funds, Obamacare, going away. Do some of those funds start to go back into Medicare? You know, they, they did. They took $816 billion, I think I recall, over 10 years from Medicare to pay for much of the expansion of, of coverage and the exchanges under Obamacare. But, but that is, again, one of those pot buckets of money that's very elusive and is not really reachable through this reconciliation process. But the difference is that Dr. Price at HHS is now in control of an agency called the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. There are opportunities to save money in Medicare by, once again, giving consumers more choice, having more competition, having more free enterprise in the, in the program, rather than this you know, 5,000 different uh, price control rules in Medicare, being able to free that up so that, that people are able to choose from, from, uh, from policies and from services that provide more value. So there is a lot of room for innovation in Medicare. And I'm confident now that rather than seeing more price controls, that we will see more innovation and more of the kind of vital, economic revitalization that we see in other parts of the economy that make things better and cheaper because we have new technologies and new ideas. That's what Medicare needs as well, but, but that's not touched. That, that money is basically now in the system 
is as a cut to Medicare, but how you do it can be creative and give people real more choices rather than cutting benefits over time. Question right here. Jay, can you Centers. Centers. How do we change that? What do we need to do to increase competition? But Jay, I can't hear the question. Do you mind repeating it, summarizing it for me? Let me try again. All right, I'm going to hold it right up. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. But what happens is you get feedback in the hall. That's what happens. Um, hospitals have bought up many, many different medical oh, services. Right. That has decreased mission opportunities. So, you know, you want to keep my their lab, all the MRIs, What do we do to increase competition? Um, I think I hear you uh, asking about how hospitals are buying up physician practices and charging more for their services. Is that what you're asking? Also, how do we increase competition among hospital groups? Uh, that's so right. I mean, what we need to do is begin to break this lock on hospital and insurance company monopolies. Government, when government is, is, is on a track toward trying to control the health sector, they want to deal with as few players as possible. And they've been basically happy with the consolidation of hospitals and insurance companies. They can just deal with a, a few of them. They're basically, they're basically government-run utilities. But what you need is to really have an explosion of creativity. Some of this is up to the states. They've got to, those states that have certificate of need laws are basically keeping competition out. They're saying, we're going to decide whether a community needs a new MRI, whether they need a new hospital, whether they need a, need a new surgical center. That reduces competition and it makes things more expensive for the, the players that are still in the market can charge more money. There's a, a network of surgical centers, physician-owned hospitals, Surgical Center of Oklahoma, that have shown they can have dramatic improvements in the quality of patient care and at much, much lower prices than the big hospitals do. But the big hospitals have been very effective in lobbying against those surgical centers. So states need to reduce their certificate of need laws and the um, we need to have antitrust legislation, which is one of the things that the House has already passed, so that, that we can't, we don't have all of these monopolies because when you have one seller in a market, a hospital that has bought up most of the hospital practice, most of the doctor's practices, they're basically setting the prices. You don't need price controls when they basically set the prices. And I will tell you that it is costing the system so much more money. Because if a doctor sells his or her practice to a hospital, the hospital can charge sometimes four times more for that same procedure that the doctor has been doing in his office, still is doing in his office, but because he's under the umbrella of a hospital, the hospital can charge much more. So this is one of the things that, again, driving up the cost of health insurance and health care We've got to break up these monopolies, have much more competition, not just in health insurance, but among providers, so that they are able to have real competition and not have these artificial government constraints. One of the things that I think could do a lot to expand the reach of medical care is telemedicine, allowing physicians to, to do what we're doing right here so that they can talk with the patient virtually um, have labs that may be centrally located. You don't have to have a laboratory every, you know, every half mile in a city so that there could be central 
um, central facilities that could do this and uh, do lab tests in a much more efficient way. A lot of electronic technologies that could allow this, but many state licensure laws don't allow it. So again, we get back to some state laws that need to be relaxed to allow more competition, to allow more freedom for people to be able to have providers, not just in their states or communities, but wherever they can find expertise that works for them. Are there some states that do allow teleconferencing medicine? Are there states now that do allow that? Oh, yes. There are some states that do. Um, whether or not they allow a physician from another state to talk to a patient, let's say you have a physician who's on call. There's something called a teledoc, and the doctor will be on call, a regular physician that's working extra hours, to take calls from people who you know want to know if they're um, their headache, their earache, their infection is something that they should could, should be seen or can the doctor prescribe over the phone. Um, many states require that they have to be licensed in that state to talk to that patient. That doesn't make any sense because the, whether the patient lives in Delaware or Pennsylvania doesn't matter. It ma what matters is the doctor's expertise in being able to, to prescribe. So some states do. Uh, that's that's really a good question, though. That that would be a good research paper for us, is to find out where telemedicine is allowed and what is that doing to the cost of health care in that state. That that's a really good idea. Thank you for that for that suggestion. We'll do some research on that. I'm going to take two more questions, Grace Marie. Here's one. Hi, I'm Judith. Hi, Judith. Right. Um, I didn't hear the question once again, so sorry. Let's try one more time. Repeat the question. Can you just repeat it? Because I can hear you, Jay. Okay, great. Secretary Price is changing some of the things in the bill. Will his changes be permanent? Mm. Well, he can't actually change the legislation. The Obama administration thought it could change the legislation, but Dr. Price, and you saw that executive order from the president, only where he has legal authority. But he's going to figure out where the Obama administration did succeed and it, exceed its legal authority and pull back on that. But he has, there's a lot of creativity over there. And the important thing is they have such a different vision in this administration than the Obama administration did. The Obama administration really believed that they were the smartest people. They could figure out what we all needed to do, what kind of health care we needed, how the health insurance industry should work, how the health sector should operate. This administration doesn't think that. They believe there is an enormous well of creativity and innovation that would be unleashed if we had the op if, if, if innovators had the opportunity to provide those options. There's a company called eHealth that has basically it's an online broker for health insurance. It was doing for 10 years what healthcare.gov tried to do and fail. They just would have gone to eHealth, they wouldn't have had their health and healthcare healthcare.gov flop. Innovation is possible out there. There are Uber kinds of delivery where a doctor comes to your house. I mean, I can't we can't even imagine the things that will be possible. And this administration wants to support and enable that kind of innovation. And frankly, one of the reasons that 50 big organizations the American Medical Association, the AARP, the American Hospital Association, the Federation of American Hospitals all lined up against this American Health Care Act is because this is an effort to drain the swamp. Basically say we're taking power away from Washington, we're turning it to the states and ultimately to doctors and patients and they don't like that. They want to control this from Washington. So Dr. Price is going to do everything he can through regulation to 
return power and control. He's a physician. He's a he's an orthopedic surgeon. He understands the importance of the doctor patient relationship. And he's going to look at those regulations and have his staff look at them in a way that can give people and the market more opportunities to create innovative solutions that most of us really couldn't even imagine right now. Last question. Jay, can you repeat it for me? Obamacare has over a hundred agencies to implement Obamacare. The hundred agencies for Obamacare is is very complicated. Will the new provision reduce the number of bureaucracies? Yes, absolutely. It will. Um, they don't need them because they don't want to control every everything that happens in the health sector. They want to diffuse this to the states. I put this slide back up here again. The person who actually developed this slide um, and this drawing and depiction of Obamacare. Okay, this is this is not just a cartoon. This really is individual agencies and powers and you notice that the secretary of health and human services is really at the center of the universe and and president trump has said for every new regulation you pass you have to get rid of two and so when every time dr that dr price is going to pass some new regulation that gives people more flexibility he's going to get rid of a couple of these others that will that are really constraining the free market in our health sector so it, the American Health Care Act was only a little over 100 pages. The Obamacare legislation was 2,700 pages of legislation. So you can just see right there that this is um, a major effort to try to scale back government's role in our health sector. This is only a first step. This does not do the whole thing. We've got to have a lot more regulatory change. We have to have a lot more individual bills passed. Association health plans and medical malpractice reform, antitrust legislation, those all have to happen as well. But we have to start this journey, and I'm very optimistic that we'll figure out what that plan B is so we can get back on track to moving toward the kind of health sector that the American people have said for the last four elections they want. We have to deliver on that. And I really, I really hope that you will contact me, sign up for ObamacareWatch.org uh, newsletter so that people, so that you can keep up to date. Every week we send out an update of the best articles about what's happening. I hope you'll join us there. And please join us at Galen.org also to see what we're writing about uh, how we get to a free market in the health sector. And thank you so much for having me with you tonight. Let's thank Grace Marie for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. And uh, Grace Murray, we'll put your we'll put your contact information and how to sign up for your email. We'll send that out to everybody who attended and was online. That's fine, and I invite anyone to use any of these slides that are useful to you. And uh, thanks for helping us get through the challenges. So have a great night. Thanks again. Thank you.